camera issue. I don't want the camera. I want the screen share. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Andrea says she's got it. Let's see. Anybody else? All right. Okay. Now it's coming through. Hey, it's all too complicated. This internet business, much, much too complicated. All right. Let's try one more thing. Let's try that. All right, it's sound. Hey, now we all see it. Well, we'll start from the again, from the beginning. Don't worry, we didn't miss too much visually. Uh, so this is the most important part, uh, which that we were discussing, which is this is what a glaze looks like up close. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a glaze. Uh, this is from my friend Dave Finklenberg's uh, graduate work at Alfred University. And what we are looking at, it's a little bit confusing, but this is the actual glaze. This is a broken cross section. This is the clay body up close. We've got all sorts of bubbles in this glaze. This one's upside down, so it's a bit much to look at. Um, but uh, this is the surface of the glaze here. This is the cross section of the glaze, and then this is the clay body. But this is what a glaze looks like up close. It's a very, very thin coating of glass. And that's about it. That's all that we need to, to see from that glaze. Now, of course, there is more that goes on in a glaze than just the, um, uh, uh, than just the final glass. Of course, we have to make a glass and that comes from the raw materials. Uh, in our glaze. Now, if you've never mixed a glaze before, you've never seen these uh, uh, before, but these are the raw minerals that make up a glaze. This is a couple of images of some of them. Uh, these are nepheline cyanide and whiting, EPK and flint and cobalt carbonate. And these are some great pictures uh, that Derek Ow from glazy.org took of them. Um, but yeah, they are uh, really cool, cool materials, but it's what's making up all of our commercial and our homemade glazes, just these raw minerals. These raw minerals do come from natural sources, of course. Uh, and in fact, they are all generally coming in the form of rocks. Uh, and these rocks come from mines generally. This is a deposit of kaolin in Venezuela. Oh, should I Hold on. I said, Tim says people are coming over now. I guess the location changed. As far as I know, I think I'm in Clay Buddies, but it's all, it's all so weird. People will be coming over. The neighbors are coming. Got slides on the phone now. Awesome. Yeah, I think we solved the slide issue, but I don't know if I posted the new video in the right place. And the doorbell's about to ring because here comes one of the neighbor kids and we're going to ignore them. Ding dong. Sorry, of course, all of my kids are home too and are the neighbor kids, but we'll deal with that later. Yay, found you. Sorry for the confusion. I think Tim is probably posting the link over in the uh, the previous posting. Um, so this is a deposit of kaolin. Um, uh, 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 yeah, started a new one. Tim says, I don't know how to put the link into the new one though, but yes, we are in a new one, everybody. All right. So this is a deposit of kaolin. Kaolin is the basic mineral that makes clay. Now we all think of clay as the stuff that we're throwing and building with, but clay is actually based in a mineral called kaolin. Um, which is a rock that is mined out of the earth and ground up into those fine powders that we see. Those very fine powders are all just ground up rocks and minerals. Um, 
So the, the minerals themselves are coming straight out of the earth and they are ground up into these fine powders. Now, if we go into a ceramic supply store, we are just sold the powder and we often have a hard time conceiving of what they are, where they came from, but they came from very specific rocks with very specific chemistries, just like this kale. Um, but these are some scanning electron micrographs of what those powders look like up close. These are two of them. These are some SEMs I took. Uh, this is flint, also called silica or also called quartz on the left. And this is feldspar. Now there's a lot of different feldspars out there, but it's a common ingredient in our glazes. It's what we call a flux. It helps to melt our glazes at lower temperatures, uh, uh, like uh, uh, getting those temperatures down because our glasses naturally melt at incredibly low low temperatures. Now, again, this is the diameter of a human hair for reference with these materials, because even though they may feel like very, very fine powders um, uh, uh, in between our fingers or when we look at them, they are just rocks that are ground incredibly fine. They are so fine that we can't feel them as rocks in between our fingers, but they are, in fact, real rocks they're just really tiny. In fact, how tiny are they? Um, these are two common materials in glazes, like I said, flint and feldspar. This here is what clay looks like in a uh, uh, in its natural microscopic state. Um, but clay is incredibly, incredibly tiny. Now we did just see it as that rock. Uh, uh, in that deposit, but this is what clay looks like. And it's a wide flat particle, but it's even smaller than the feldspar and quartz. You see this little rectangle drawn in here. That is the actual size of this box in comparison. Clay is incredibly, incredibly small and fine. But when we are making a glaze, we take all of these raw materials and we take a formula. We take that formula and if you are batching on your own, there are lots of places where you can get formulas. Of course, my personal favorite is glazy.org, G-L-A-Z-Y.org. And it's a collection of glaze formulas and all sorts of information for learning about glazes. Um, so you'll collect a formula and you will go, you can uh, go and buy all of these raw materials at the same ceramic supply store where you buy your clay. They'll sell you all the materials you need and you take a formula and you weigh it out. And when we combine all of these individual ingredients, we get to the particular chemistry that makes this glass that is our glaze coating. This is a totally generic cone 10 glossy glaze formula here. This is one called four three, two, one, and it makes a nice glossy tan glaze at cone 04. And making your own glaze is super simple for those of you who have never made your own glaze and have only worked with bottled glazes. Um, it is as simple as following the recipe. Of course, there's a lot more to learn than just that, but that is the basics of it, that all we need to do is to follow the recipe to make our glaze. Now, of course, we're here to talk about glaze application and what our glaze application is, is in fact the application of this combination of minerals on the surface of our pot. And this cartoon version is, can't, uh, Lois is saying can't post comments. There are comments, Lois, but they're coming through in the live stream. I'm not sure where they are. Um, but Lois just sent me a private message that says she can't post comments, but I'm getting them in the live stream. So um, you might have to check with Tim as to where they're coming through because I don't know uh, on that one. Um, so uh, a glaze application is taking a whole bunch of these minerals, putting them onto the surface of our pot, and then putting them in the kiln to melt them, right? That's what we do in the melting process in our kiln. So we'll have things like clay, that's our hexagonal particles, and feldspars and quartz and calcium carbon and all these materials coming together to make a glaze. Um, and to see one of the coolest things that you've never seen before, uh, this series of images here are some pictures from my friend Tom Lamb. Tom is uh, one of the 
uh, coolest guys I know. He currently runs sc uh, a scanning electron microscopy, or I'm sorry, he works for scanning electron microscopy at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, and what we see here is a, uh, a series of images of a glaze melting. You see, uh, this is from uh, Tom's work when he was a student at Alfred University. And at the university, we have something really cool, which is an incredibly powerful microscope called an SEM with a kiln inside of it. Um, and so what we can do is we can take a glaze formula and we can watch the glaze melt. Okay, so this is really, really cool. So what we are looking at here, we'll start in the upper uh, right hand or the upper left hand corner. And what we see is these are all those same raw materials. These little specks are clay in our formula. Then these big chunks are feldspar and flint and whiting and all the other ingredients in our glaze formula. Right. And we can see like, let's, let's just take a, let's take a second and we're going to put our eyes right on this big chunk here in the corner because here's a big chunk of feldspar, and then there's two little flecks of clay on top of it. Well, we're going to start already at temperature. This is 800 degrees Celsius. Now, I have to warn you, uh, we do work in the sciences in Celsius. I know there's a lot of Americans in here that speak in Fahrenheit, um, and we'll get some Fahrenheit in here later. But at 800 degrees Celsius, this is about cone O16. All right, so we're at O16 already. So this is quite, quite hot. Um, we haven't reached bis temperature or anything like that, but it's still super hot. Then we're going to start increasing temperature. Now, as we go up to 1050, this is about cone O5. Uh, so this is around bisque temperature. And what we have going on here is we can still see that same chunk of feldspar, and we can see these individual little grains of clay on that material. So to say, even when we get to bis temperature, all the materials are still there. Nothing has started to melt. So we're going to keep increasing temperature. We're going to go to 1100 C, 1175, and even 1200 C. 1200 C is about cone four. So we're about cone 03, about cone 01, and about cone four. Um, Celsius, I'm doing the cones. I know everybody's shocked at the Celsius. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, so we're getting up to cone four and the amazing thing is look at this at cone four in the central 1200 C image, those same grains of clay are still there. Nothing has started to melt and nothing has started to change. Now I should contextualize that this is a cone 10 uh, uh, clay, uh, cone 10 glaze. Okay. But at 1200 degrees Celsius, that's at cone four. So we're about six, uh, six cones under our peak temperature. All right. And we can still see all the individual items that were there at lower temperature because nothing has started to melt. As the temperature goes up, 1250 C here, so this is about cone six, um, now things are starting to melt. They're starting to turn into one large homogeneous mass at 1270 and 1300 and at 1330. We can see that everything is melting and has finally formed our glass as we get up to cone 10. But the important detail is, is that it is just a collection of minerals, right? That's all that's going on that we get all of those minerals uh, melting together to form our glass. And that is what makes a glaze. It is just that simple. We just need to get the right combination of minerals. But one thing to note when we're talking about glaze firing is that we always have this assumption that just everything's melting all during the glaze firing, but that is not true. We really don't get any worthwhile melting until the last 100 degrees C of the firing. That's 180 degrees Fahrenheit um, or the last six to eight cones. Up until then, we're just building up the temperature inside our kiln. But we're here to talk about application. So we need to go back and think about how we apply our glaze. Okay, so we're going to take this combination of minerals of different rocks that are ground up into a very fine powder, and we're going to mix them with water, and we're going to apply that to the surface of our pot. 
right? An application of glazes to our work reply, uh, relies on a very, very important concept, and that is called capillary suction, okay? And capillary suction is the concept that our clay body, when bist or even when it's green, has a suction power. It will actually draw water to its surface. So let's do, oops, let's do a little animation. We're going to apply a glaze to the surface of our clay. So our white box here, this is the surface of our bisqueware, and we're going to throw some wet glaze on there. And that capillary suction is going to draw the particles in that wet glaze to the surface, and it's going to absorb water. You can see how our clay body has, uh, has now changed color because it has absorbed all the water in that glaze. Then we pull the pot out, and what happens is we now have this collection of particles that have built up into the surface. And that is what we are going to melt to form the glaze. Um, but of course, we're not quite done there yet. Um, um, uh, we still have to dry the piece. You see, the reason why glaze application dries so quickly is because of capillary suction. The clay body is sucking all of the water out of that wet gla glaze and into the clay itself. Okay, so now all that water is in the clay body. So our clay is now saturated with water. And that's why it dries so quickly. It's not through evaporation, the water going out into the atmosphere. Now, that's not to say that evaporation does not take place. In fact, it does. Eventually, before the piece gets fired, the water comes back out in the form of vapor and does dry up in the atmosphere, just leaving us with this coat of raw materials on the surface. Now, we do have to make one note that if you are trying to reglaze a piece, if you've ever tried that before, you'll know that it's exceptionally difficult to do. And that is because our clay has been vitrified. It has been melted into glass and high temperature clay bodies are in fact melted into glass. Well, this is a huge problem uh, if you are trying to reglaze because when you uh, have vitrified the clay body, it no longer has capillary suction, okay? It can't dry wa draw water in, and so instead it's waiting for the water to evaporate, which is a very slow process, which is why the one way to get glazes to stick on reapplication is to heat the work up. You are trying to make the work act as a radiator to force the water to evaporate. But that's something we can talk about a little bit later. So right now we've dipped our pot into the wet glaze and we get this collection of minerals on the surface. Now that's a dip application. Of course, we do have some other methods of application to consider. Um, one would be a spray. Okay, A spray application is pretty simple. We take the same wet glaze and we put it through an atomizing spray gun. What this spray gun does is that it breaks up our wet glaze into little pellets. They're little tiny pellets. They're very, very hard to see with the naked eye, but they are little pellets. Now, like we've and like I've drawn down here, we it's just a collection of those same minerals, but the pressure of a spray gun forces them into little pellets and they sit on the surface of that clay. And that's all that's going on with a spray application, right? We're just taking that and we are uh, um, uh, and we're just making it into those individual little nodules of glaze, but that's all that's going. Spraying is a good way to get a very, very consistent application. Although it may seem like a dip is a good consistent application, it really has a lot of issues with it because we can get different levels of absorption or capillary suction inside our clay. But with a spray, we do tend to get a very, very even coat, and that's what it's good at. Now, one method that a lot of you may be familiar with if you're just starting out um, is the brush method. Now, brushing uh, is uh, um, a, a pretty common method, especially with commercial glazes, because we only generally buy a quart or a pint of them at once. Um, and so we don't often know what's going on with our brushing glazes. Now, the first thing to understand about a brushing glaze is that chemically, the materials are exactly the same as a glaze you make yourself. They're buying the same raw materials. What they're doing with a brushing glaze is that they are mixing it up with a certain uh, amount of water and some suspension aid 
aids. This is to keep the glaze from settling at the bottom. You see, like I said, all of those minerals that we're using are in fact tiny little rocks and rocks don't like to float in water. They are going to sink to the bottom of the bucket if you let it sit around. So we, they will add suspension age, agents to the glaze to help keep it suspended. They also add some materials that'll help to delay water absorption. Um, like I said, if you've ever worked with a dipping glaze, the, um, uh, uh, the, the glaze will dry almost instantaneously. Um, whereas with brushing glazes, they stand, tend to stay wet for a little bit longer. This is because they add in some chemicals that uh, make it so the clay body doesn't absorb the water very quickly. And so uh, you can push it around and try to get it more even. Although on that story about the evenness of glaze application, brushing is about as bad as it can get. Um, it is definitely a difficult way to apply glazes. Uh, um, and it's going to give you a fairly inconsistent coat. Um, um, but chemically, they are the same. It's just a bunch of uh, materials mixed up in a specific formula and suspended in water. Um, but uh, uh, those are our three basic uh, uh, versions of glaze application. And those, there's not a ton to describe about the application methods. If you dip, you dip. If you brush, you brush. And if you spray, you spray. But one, some of the things that we have to look at are the variables that influence our glaze application. That becomes uh, a really, really uh, uh, important series of variables to consider when we are applying our glazes. And the first thing that we need to talk about is the bisking process. And of course, we do have to ask the question, why do we bisque? Now, I'm sure many of you have been given an infinite number of answers to that question, but there is one very, very simple answer as to why we bisque. And that answer is explosions. Um, because we don't want to find out that our work has exploded after a glaze firing, because then it will have exploded all over the other work. But we'll talk about that in a second. Now, it is true that bisque firing does make the clay more durable for the glazing process. It is true that it does remove some volatile compounds from the clay, some chemically bound water, some carbon and sulfur forms. Um, and actually, hopefully, one of the reasons why we bisque is because we want to kill our work if it's going to happen. Right? We want the work to die so that we don't spend time glazing a piece of work that's going to break in a later firing. Now, bisking does not guarantee that we know that the work is going to break, but it does increase the chances. This is such the fact that industrial dinnerware manufacturers will often bisque to cone 10 and then glaze to cone 04. They do this to make sure the work breaks if it's going to break. They don't want to waste kiln space and worker time making work that's not going to survive to be finished work. So they just fire it all the way up to temperature because if it's going to die, it's going to die and they don't have to waste time and energy on it. But most of us bisque to lower temperatures and we'll talk about that in a second. But back to the explosions, uh, I do want to address one thing out there, one myth that is constantly perpetuated in uh, ceramics, which is that why work explodes. Now, I previously mentioned that work explodes because of water, or, or that work explodes in a kiln, and that's why we want to bisque. But the reason why it explodes is not because of air pockets. Now, I am a man of science. I don't peddle in myth or rumor. I don't care about it. Uh, not to be uh, mean, but I, I don't care what you may have been told by a previous teacher. If they told you that air pockets are the reason why ceramics explodes, they are wrong. 100% absolutely wrong. Sorry, neighbor kids are trying to get my kids to play, but later. Um, uh, work 100% of the time dies because of water. 
more specifically because of steam. You see, steam creates pressure. In fact, steam is such a powerful material. Uh, steam is how most electricity is generated in the world. Uh, in fact, nuclear energy, nuclear uh, reactors are just giant tea kettles. They are just there to make uh, steam. They, they create a lot of heat and boil water, which moves turbines. The same thing is going on in coal-fired power plants and uh, um, uh, natural gas-fired power plants. Um, but uh, your work is exploding because of steam, not air. You see, air can get out really, really easily because of the capillaries, right? That clay body has capillaries, which is an open network that goes all the way through your clay body. And the air can <laughs> you have to tell the kids to go home <laughs> um, uh, uh, because air can uh, get through uh, all of those capillaries, but steam can't. You see, steam gets into a roadblock. So if the steam gets it, it gets built up in your work, it will create pressure and that will make the work explode. And again, this is why we really want to bisque because the thought of a piece of um, uh, uh, the thought of a piece of glazed work in the form of a once fired glazed work exploding is really bad because when that piece explodes, it's going to look like this picture on the screen. And in fact, what will happen is you will get shrapnel of glazed pieces everywhere on your work, on all the surrounding work, on the shelves, on the walls, on the elements, everywhere. And you might not find out about it until after the firing is done. And that means you've got glazed chunks on everything in your kiln. Now you hear all the time, people will say, oh, 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 I dried my piece for weeks and it exploded. Yeah, great. It wasn't dry. That's just a fact. If the work exploded, it had water in it. Now, remember, water stays until 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That is 100 degrees Celsius. And that's why a lot of bisque cycles will have that, uh, uh, that as a dwell time to allow the water in the form of steam to escape. But I can't say it enough. I see a lot of people in the chat really liking this, that, yeah, it is steam, not air, that causes explosions. Now, and the last thing I'll say is, yes, oftentimes if you build something with a big void in the middle, they tell you to put a pinhole in it. Again, that's not to allow air to escape. That's to allow steam to escape because if steam builds up pressure, that's going to be a huge problem. Now, as to bisking itself, of course, this is our lower temperature first firing. There is a whole lot of discussion as to what temperature is best. Now, I like a cone 08 bisque, full stop, and I work exclusively in porcelain. Now, some people will say that porcelain needs to be fired hotter to cone 04. No, that's actually not true. Um, um, and I definitively prefer a lower bisque. Um, but at the end of the day, you can bisque to whatever temperature you want to. Um, the point of bisking is to fire the work as hot as possible before we begin to engage in this vitrification, in this melting process but to then shut off the kiln right before we get there. But I personally like a lower temperature bisque. Now, like I said, the actual temperature you fire to is not all that particularly important, but what is important is to have a consistent bisque temperature, okay? To always bisque to the same temperature because the quality of your glaze application will always depend on the level of bisque, okay? Now I see some questions of why do I bisque to cone 08? I'll, I'll come around to that in a minute. Um, uh, but um, there's a couple of things to note. You should always be bisking to the same temperature. Don't just bisque uh, at, at, at from you know cone 06 in this firing and cone 08 in that firing. Stay consistent because I'll show you here in a second, it absolutely will affect your glaze application. 
So why? Well, let's talk about what's going on with glaze thickness. You see, every single glaze is going to need its own application thickness. So here's one glaze out there. It's called DDM222. It is a cone 10 oxidation glaze. You can find it on Glazy, but here's the formula right here. Uh, it's formula uh, 11,733 on Glazy. Um, but what we see here is that this is all the same glaze formula, exactly the same glaze formula. They were all mixed with 60 milliliters of water for a 100 gram batch. Now, this is the first thing I want to emphasize. You should be weighing your water if you are mixing your own glazes. 100%, if you are mixing your own glazes, you should be treating water content as a constant. And if you are working with commercial glazes, they should be using the same amount of water in every batch. But we don't have a lot of control over that with commercial glazes, but we'll talk about how to monitor it and control it in a minute here. But what we see here is the same glaze from the same batch. I just changed how long I dipped each tile for. You see, this is a thin, a quick application. This here on the upper right is a two second dip. On the bottom left is a four second dip. And on the bottom right is a six second dip, all of the same glaze. Well, we can see that we're getting really different variations on how thick this glaze is applying and how the effect that this glaze creates is changing. You see, this is a variation on what we call an oil spot glaze and it needs to be thick to get this spotting effect. Um, you see these little nodules, these little, these little uh, hurricanes in there are bubbles that popped and healed in the firing. And that doesn't happen unless the glaze is thick enough. Now, like I said, I did this by um, um, uh, uh, applying for different amounts of time with a very consistent water content and a very consistent cone 08 bisque temperature. But let's look at what happens when we change our bisque temperature. This is the same glaze. This time I mixed it with a little bit less water. I only mixed it with 50 grams of water in a 100 gram glaze batch. But what I have here are two different sets of bisque temperatures. On the top row, all the tiles were bisque to cone 08. And on the bottom row, these were all bisque to cone 04. Okay. Then again, I did the same application time. This is a two second dip, a four second dip, a six second dip, and an eight second dip. And they all look radically different. Why? Because on the different water, con I'm sorry, on the different application times and the different bis temperatures, we are getting different levels of absorption. OK, because that capillary suction is corresponding to absorption. You see, the lower we bisque, the more absorption your clay body has. And so the more glaze particles stick to the surface. OK, and this is a really important concept. That's why. Um, that's why we get this absolutely different thickness in application. Now you can see as we go to the 04 bisque with an eight second dip, it's starting to look like the cone 08 bisque with a two second dip, but it took a four times longer application. And again, that time of application was exactly the same. The clay is exactly the same. The glaze batch is exactly the same. Okay, these are all the same thing. The only difference is that these were bis to cone 08 and these were bis to cone 04. Just the change in your bis temperature will give you an incredibly different variation in absorption and in performance. Now, again, to put that into context, here is uh, uh, an 08 bisque. Now, when I bisque, oops, sorry, jumping ahead. When I bisque my clay body, my personal clay body that I work with at cone 08, it has an absorption level of 19.68%, or of course, roughly 20% absorption. That means if I soak it in water, it can gain 20% of its weight in in water. Now, what I have here is a series of glaze tests, each mixed with a different amount of water. So each of these was a 100 gram glaze test that I mixed with different amounts of water. So this is 50 grams of water, 60 grams of water, 70, 
80, 90, and 100. Hey, Stacy. Um, and then they were all applied for that same eight second dip. And of course, again, now we're looking at the same bis temperature with different water content because water content is the second variable that we need to consider when we are talking about how our glaze application functions. Um, because the less water there is in our glaze, say at 50 grams, what that means is that we get more water being absorbed which means more clay, more glaze particles being drawn to the surface and making a thicker coating. Now we can even see that in the way that these run. This one is obviously running and then the running goes down as the water content goes up. Well, we're getting less physical particles being drawn to the surface. So we get a less thick glaze application. So we get less running. Running is more often than not a condition of how thick our glaze is. Our glazes really run for two major reasons. Uh, one is that they are too thick and two is that they are over fired. This one's actually not over fired. It's just really, really thick. Um, but we can see that we also then lose that effect of this peacocking glaze when we go to 100 grams of water. Now, again, this is 100 grams of water for 100 grams of glaze. That's a lot. And I actually don't really have a preference as to what water content you should use. Similarly to what I was saying of having a consistent bis temperature, you should be weighing and keeping your water levels consistent. Now, just for reference, this is the same test done at cone 04 bisque. Now, my clay body, bisque to cone 04, has 18.86% absorption or about 17% absorption, but that is 3% less than the same clay body at cone 08. So again, for that same eight second dip, I am getting less absorption of water, less absorption of glaze, and a less thick coating. Now, Again, we can make that glaze have the peacocky effect, but again, we need to control our variables. You need to decide and be really consistent. Like I said, the whole key is not so much the exact specifics, but the key is consistency of your, of your glaze application. And the other thing to realize is that every single clay body is going to be different. So this is a clay. This is actually some B mix that Stacy here sent to me to test. And this is a firing curve. So what we are looking at is the absorption of our uh, clay body as we fire it to different temperatures. The blue line here is the firing curve. The orange line is a metric that we use in the science is called density, which is how dense a fired clay is. But the important thing is the blue line for absorption. You see at cone 06, B mix um, has absorption of 15%. Well, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that one way or the other, but for contrast, my clay body at cone 08 has absorption of 20%. So my clay is going to have a lot more absorption at cone 08 than Stacy's B-mix is at cone 06. Similarly, at cone 04 though, Stacy's clay body drops way, 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 way down to 11% absorption at cone 04, whereas mine only drops down to 17% at cone 04. Is this a problem? No, but it is actually going to make glaze application more difficult. Um, you're going to need to do more coats or longer applications to get a more consistent application because how open that clay body is, how much water it's drawing inside and how many particles it's drawing to the surface are going to control the fire quality of that glaze. So every clay is different and I cannot emphasize that. And I'm not just talking about my clay body versus Stacy's. I'm talking about every clay body you're using. If you're your studio has three different clay bodies going or five, they're all going to have different absorption at different bis temperatures. And you really should know what those are to make the most out of your glaze application to get consistent application every single time. Now, one of the things we do have to talk about are some metrics that some people like to use when talking about glaze application. So we return to our friend here, this DDM222. And the first thing to know is that um, 
I cannot underemphasize, weigh your water. If you are making up your own glazes, weigh your water. It should have a weight, just like this formula has a weight. You know, you need 45.92 grams of Mahavir Feldspar and 15.73 grams of whiting. This formula needs 60 grams of water. In like full stop, end of the day, that's what it is. Now, you can make your glaze with 50, you can make your glaze with 70, but when you batch your glaze, you should be weighing your water to always have control. Now, not all of us have the same control of mixing our own glazes, and sometimes we are left with commercial glazes, and that brings up a metric called specific gravity. All right. Now this might be, might, you might see a bunch of numbers and calculations and now all of a sudden everybody's eyes might start rolling back in their heads, but stick with me. Okay. I swear it won't hurt too much in the end. Specific gravity is a reflection of how much material is inside that glaze. So what's the proportion of water to those particles inside our glaze application? And specific gravity is really easy to calculate. What you're going to do is you're going to divide mass by volume. And what we see here is a measurement of specific gravity here in my studio. What I have here is a syringe, okay? This is a 60 milliliter syringe that I filled with 50 milliliters of glaze. So that becomes my volume, 50 milliliters. I then weighed my syringe. Actually, I zeroed out my scale so it doesn't count the weight of the syringe. But then I weighed it, and what I found is that 50 milliliters of glaze weighed 86.09 grams. So that becomes my calculation, 89.06 divided by 50, giving me a specific gravity of 1.72. Now, that number might not mean a lot to you. To put it in perspective, water, pure water, has no particles in it, or at least it shouldn't. So it has a specific gravity of one, and the higher the number goes, the higher the proportion of particles in that glaze compared to water, okay? And that becomes the variable, how much water to material that we want. Now, you can use specific gravity on your commercial glazes. Um, uh, that with a commercial glaze, um, you can use a syringe or something else that measures volume, hopefully in liters or milliliters. Um, don't try to use cups, then it gets a little bit complicated. But if you can measure volume and mass, you can calculate specific gravity. Okay. And it can help you maintain your glaze in the long term. So say you've working in a studio and it's got a big buckets of glaze that are using being used by dozens of people or even by you over time. Water is going to get evaporated and the glaze is going to change its behavior over time. Well, one thing you can do is go back and measure the specific gravity and say, is this still the 1.72 that it's always been? Or do I need to add some more water to you know, to get it back to where it needs to be. So specific gravity is really good for long-term uh, metrics of glazes. But one thing to understand is that each and every glaze is going to have its own specific gravity. Okay. So you can't go and say, oh, every glaze out there should have a specific gravity of 1.7. No, 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 no. Every single formula is going to have its own specific gravity. So the really important thing is to maintain consistent specific gravity. And the next thing to understand is that specific gravity can lie to you. Here is the sample we were just looking at. We can see its weight is 86.09. And here is another sample of the same glaze. That's weight is very, very similar, almost exactly the same at 86.43. They both have the same specific gravity, but watch this. This is these two glazes being poured. And I don't know if the frame rate's good enough. Hopefully you can all see it. But the glaze on the left is very, very thin and the glaze on the right is very, very thick, even though they have the same specific gravity. Now I show you this because a lot of people like to treat specific gravity like it's a panacea, like it's the answer for keeping your glazes consistent. It's not. This is why I'm such an advocate of weighing your water because specific gravity can be manipulated. You see, I added a coagulant to the glaze on the right. I added some Epsom salts to thicken up this glaze. 
that doesn't change the specific gravity because I didn't add any relevant amounts of water to the glaze. I just added Epsom salt, which will make your glaze get thicker. And that's a trick you can use if you have a glaze that's consistently thin. If you mix up some Epsom salt in water, you make an Epsom salt solution, which is generally 110 grams of Epsom salts to 100 grams of water, you can add it as a thickening agent for your glaze. But again, different thicknesses, different flow, the same specific gravity. So you really have to be careful about how you read specific gravity. Okay. Because there is another metric, and this is the one besides weighing water that gets completely ignored that I cannot underemphasize. And this is viscosity. Uh, Tracy, I'll get to that question in a second. Um, that is viscosity. You see, viscosity is how things flow. Each and every glaze is going to have a different viscosity based on the particles that are in that glaze and the water content. This is a series of uh, test cups. These are called Zahn cups. And what they are is that they are a specific volume and they've got a hole in the bottom. And as you can see, each one of these has a different size hole. So they drain at different rates. That's what the little video here is showing. So this is a number five, four, three, two, and one Zahn cup. And what you can watch this time is you'll see they drain at different rates. And how we measure viscosity is you just take a Zahn cup and you measure how long it takes for your glaze to drain and that gives you a number right um, now in general we recommend using a number two zon cup which is this one um, uh, right here on the end um, uh, uh, because it takes you know roughly about 30 seconds to drain um, watch out a lot of places will sell number four zon cups which is the second one watch this video the problem with those is that they dry very quickly or I'm sorry, they, they drain very quickly, not dry. So, okay, so ready? So we're going to drop it. And then the first one's about done now. And here comes the second one. It only gives you about eight seconds to count. And that doesn't really affect, uh, doesn't give you a good reading. Whereas the number two gives you a good long time to measure how long that glaze takes to drain. Now, again, with the bis temperature and with the water content, there is no one standard uh, time that you need your glaze to run. The real condition is how uh, uh, having a consistent uh, uh, drain time on your Zon cup. So if you know your glaze takes 22 seconds to drain, you want to always keep it at 22 seconds to drain. And that's a really important detail. Now, a couple of people are coming in um, asking about things. Let's see, Denise is asking about tap water versus distilled water. Let me tell you, Denise, I've made glazes all over the world on virtually every continent except Antarctica. Uh, actually, I still haven't been to Australia. I've had a lot of students in Australia. Water content uh, can affect it in that you can have some calcium or um, uh, magnesium in your natural glaze, but really at the end of the day, it's not a huge difference. I use tap water for all of my glaze tests and all my glaze tests come out perfect. Uh, Erin has a question, then she said, never mind. Um, also, how fresh or how, oh, Catherine's asking how fresh or how old the glazes are in the bucket. That's very important because our materials can break down and to cause our glazes to coagulate or to thin over time. This is why weighing water content and measuring specific gravity and measuring viscosity are so important because um, we need to maintain Z-H-A-N. Um, we need to maintain consistent application uh, or consistent viscosity and specific gravity in our glaze. Uh, some questions about disper oh yeah, dispersants and vinegar. Um, yes, that that those types of materials can affect surface chemistry. Um, that 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 certainly can. Dispersants are materials like Darvan. They will make a glaze thin the same way that um, uh, uh, Epsom salts will make a glaze thick. They have opposite effects on our materials. Uh, Julianne's asking about oolites. Oolites are um, what happens um, when uh, uh, soluble materials occur in our glaze. Now, theoretically, all the materials we're using are rocks and shouldn't dissolve in water. Unfortunately, that is not true um, because our materials are naturally occurring and in fact can dissolve in water. And oftentimes they will then precipitate a material called an oolite. 
it's actually not the right term. They're not technically oolites, um, but uh, uh, you will get crystals in some of your glaze. There's not much that you can do about them. Um, you get them because you have materials that probably should have been in that glaze in the first place because they're water soluble and you don't want them there. Um, uh, but yes, you can influence the viscosity. In fact, that's what I was doing in this one is influencing the viscosity of that glaze. Uh, Diane's asking about the use of a lot of well water in her uh, iron in her well water. And should that be an issue? It may discolor your glaze uh, a little bit. Iron is a colorant. That's actually why these two are red, because they have a lot of iron in them. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't be a huge issue. Um, uh, uh, as far as the physical performance of your glaze. All righty. Well, I will more than happy to answer any questions, but wrapping up the formal part, and hey, I came in at exactly an hour with even our technical technical issues. Uh, understanding your glaze application comes down to understanding your materials, and it is both your clay and your glaze, okay? And you do need to consider things like your application method, what kind of clay, remember, every single clay is going to be different. They are going to have different absorption levels and probably you want to measure the absorption of your glaze when you start. Um, oh, Julianne, they are lying to you, but we'll get to that in a second in question and answer. Um, the type of clay makes a huge difference. The bisque temperature makes a huge difference um, that you really, really want to um, uh, um, keep those consistent. Like I said, I have my preferences. I'll talk when we're done here um, about why I like a cone 08 bisque um, before we will, uh, bef before we, we let go. Um, but um, the bisque temperature, the water content, the specific gravity, the viscosity, all of that, all I can say is you need to be consistent. We, we take it as, as sort of open and, and flexible as to what can be going on, but keeping those things consistent weighing your water content, measuring not just specific gravity, but viscosity, um, keeping consistent bis temperature, all of that um, is uh, uh, going to be a value for you to get the most out of your glazes. All right, everybody, I'll keep the stream open. We've got questions coming in, so I will turn to those. Uh, yeah, Stacy put up my website. Check us out, Strand Materials Workshop. We do do online education for anybody who wants to learn. Um, and I think this is being recorded. I've recorded it myself. I know there was a hiccup and I restarted it at an odd time and you know, had some hard things coming in, but I made a recording of it too. So I will send that to uh, Stacy or Tim um, and we'll put that off. Uh, um, uh, we'll put that up. Yeah, I, we did. My wife and I run an online education company. So we just gave, uh, I think we're at almost 7,000 uh, university online lectures we just gave up because uh, everybody had to freak out and uh, run to um, uh, uh, um, run to online teaching really quickly. Um, okay, so I will put this out there because Corey Sandler just uh, emailed me. We do have an online glaze class that starts on April 1st. She was asking if there is a coupon code. Uh, yes, there is, but there is only six of them left for our April class. Hi. My wife is in the background. It is NSICA 2020, all capitals. Um, if you want to join our April class, we've got some people. Uh, uh, Anna's in here from Denmark. She's been in there. Liz is in here in New Mexico. They've been in our classes. So uh, Stacy's taken some, so you'll know about those. Um, let's see. So, okay. So let me roll back into questions. Hey, Don, good to see you too. Thank you, everybody. You're all very welcome. So let's see. Uh, let me see how far I can go. Uh, do I have, Stacy, do I have to get off of here? Do you need the stream for anybody else? Or is the next person just going to open their page when they go? Um, hold on one second. Um, let's see any other questions. Soda ash as a soluble. Okay. Oh, so let me go back to where was your question? Um, here, actually, let me stop the, well, let's see if I can stop the screen share and I'll go back to the camera. Let's see. Not that anybody wants to look at me. Oh, did I break it or is it doing my dumb face? 
Uh oh, can't find. Uh oh. Well, let's go back to screen share. It says it can't find my camera and microphone. Can you all hear me? Check, 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 check. Greg already started. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, you're welcome, Maribel. Good to see you. Um, ah, there was a question here. They all came rolling in. Now I got to roll back. Um, who was the lady who was saying that the commercial clay company said it was because she used um, tap water? They're lying to you. Um, hey, Brian, I'm losing the conversation. There it is, Julianne. Um, yeah, they're telling you that because they're putting water soluble materials in their glaze. Um, uh, and they don't want to admit to it. Um, and so they're going to blame you for anything that goes wrong rather than, um, um, rather than taking responsibility for, for what they have done. Um, uh, yeah, the Oolites. Uh, the name of my glaze class is Understanding Glazes Online. Check out ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. Um, yeah, Nathaniel's asking about soda ash and solubility. You should not be using soda ash in your glaze unless you absolutely have to or you're using it for a specific effect, something like uh, uh, a, um, um, uh, a Chino glaze. Chino glazes use um, uh soluble sodium to create carbon trapping and their effect but commercial glazes you know i'm a total cynic i teach about glazes so i want people to learn how to make their own glazes versus buying commercial and um the phrase i often use is that there's assumption out there that the commercial glaze companies both know what they're doing and care and uh they neither of those are true um that they'll do that to get cool chemistries but have sloppy uh materials so um, they'll do that and then blame you, but that's not, it's not you. Uh, yeah. Nathaniel's asking about the chinos. Yes, they are present in chinos because of this effect called carbon trapping, where you deposit soluble sodium on the surface of your glaze, which can create darkness effects. Um, let's see. You're all very welcome. Oh, I sound like the Alton Brown Australian materials. That's very nice. I've turned glaze voodoo into science. That's my goal. That's what I do. Um, you know, we're trying to translate ceramic science into English for real working artists. So I am scrolling back, trying to get everybody. Could one make their own Zon cup? Nadine is asking. I would not do that. Um, you can buy them on Amazon for relatively cheaply, um, but you really want to have a specific volume with a specific diameter of hole. You could fake it till you make it, but um, uh, no, I, I would probably just buy one um, for the sake of it. So Susan says, I pay attention to my specific gravity depending on my glaze. Oh no, it just disappeared. Oh, this chat's moving too fast. Uh, I lost that one. I'm sorry, Susan, if you're still around, put that on. Corey says, bis temperature is a game changer. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, just going through the chat. Uh, Michelle, when your course starts, yeah, you're starting whenever your faculty member says that it starts. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Super class, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Nadine. Uh, Tina just signed up. Yes, you did. Glad to have you, Tina. Jody says, do we measure the absorption rate of the clay at BISC by doing test tiles that you showed, or is that info from the manufacturer? The manufacturer may give you that information. It is pretty simple. If you just take a test tile, weigh it dry, then boil it for two hours, then let it cool down to room temperature, uh, wipe off the surface with a damp sponge and weigh it again. The weight of the wet test tile versus the dry test tile will give you the absorption level. Uh, Marianne's asking, can you use a cone six recipe on a cone 10 clay being fired to cone six program? It is vitrified. Um, yeah, you're most likely going to get crazing um, because um, the clay body is going to be under fired at cone six. Um, anyone who says that uh, cone 10 clay bodies are fine at cone six is lying to you um, that are going to be under fired. Uh, most cone six clay bodies or clay bodies that are listed as cone 10 to cone six are a lie. They are just telling you that it's okay to under fire your cone six clay. 
uh greg started great uh, brian hey brian good to see you uh yes 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 recommended books uh yeah moving on linda bloomfield's got some decent books my personal favorite books are uh clay and glazes for the potter by daniel rhodes um ceramic science for the artist uh they're both older and they're hard to harder to find um and there's a book called um oh my god what's parmalee uh oh my gosh it's by ed cullen w parmalee and now i'm blanking on the name uh but i like parmalee they're all older books i don't there aren't any particular contemporary books that i particularly care for although linda bloomfield's doing some decent things um denise is saying yes we have mini workshops getting started uh Ooh light lady she knows okay um they don't care at all <laughs> yeah that's that's the glaze companies don't care okay is there a relationship between specific gravity and zon cups no doug um your specific gravity and your viscosity are always going to be different and are going to depend on the materials and the chemistry of the glaze you are using and so uh that's why you need to establish all of them at that temperature uh or, or or for each individual glaze no uh andrea i haven't gotten to my 08 bisque yet i am coming around to it in one second but i was just trying to get through all the questions um specific gravity determine oh you're welcome nadine you're welcome aaron uh, Rhodes. yes Rhodes does rock um parmalee ceramic glazes thank you oh my goodness uh hey there we go my brain farted okay so uh yeah i mean i'll i'll finish up if there are more questions that come through hey Corey's here uh hey Corey. uh Corey knows a little bit i'll give him that um the um uh the question about why i bis to a lower temperature the first is this notion um uh uh to to what bis temperature you you need to go for again it doesn't really matter but the point of bisking is to put through your your clay through a lot of stress um uh and to to try to burn out things that are going to burn out those carbon forms and sulfur and chemically bound water rose the door, kids are coming for the door um uh um um that that all of that happens well before a thousand degrees c which is sort of a cone uh oh six you know you'll often hear this notion that that oh you need to burn out certain materials from your glaze um uh and that's that's why you need to bisque hotter that's mostly nonsense the one exception with that is that if you have a red body a darker body that there can be some gunk that sticks around but almost all that stuff is gone uh before cone oh six uh, and even long before then. Um, so uh, the notion that you need to bisque hotter, I saw somebody did mention pinholes. Yeah, that's just not true. Pinholing is uh, a complicated subject, um, but pinholing is generally not what people think it is. Pinholing is actually three different problems. Um, there is the condition of pinholing, then there is blistering, and then there is pitting. Pinholing is an application problem, um, and that's why the higher temperature bisque doesn't work. Um, uh, I always see bisque higher if glazing is pinholing. Yeah, it's not true. Um, uh, you actually get worse glaze application. So that rate of suction in that little animation that I was showing, if you bisque lower, it's going to draw the particles to your clay body surface faster, and it's going to give you better particle packing in your glaze. And pinholes, the actual effect of pinholes is an application issue that you get um uh, uh more air pockets in between your individual particles in the glaze and that will create uh bubbles which will evolve into pinholes um blistering are is a separate problem which happens when you have iron or copper in your glaze which will decompose at high temperature um and cause a bubble that will pop late in the firing and then uh, uh pitting is a completely 
different third problem, which happens when you have titanium in your glaze, uh, titanium in the form of rutile or titanium dioxide. Um, so I like to bisque lower because I get better suction. I have 20% absorption at a cone 08 bisque, but I only have 17% absorption at a cone 04. And that, that higher absorption pulls those particles to your surface um, faster and more intensely and packs them even tighter, which gives you a better glaze application with less pinholes, right? And I cannot underemphasize how important that is to get um, a really tight particle packing um, um, uh, on your glaze application. Uh, I mean, application is a huge deal. Um, it's a long conversation, um, uh, 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 but um, that's why I like a low bisque. And the last thing I'll say on it is um, that, you know, Derek Ao, who created Glaze.org, he lived in Jingdezhen, China for many years. And he reports to me that everyone there bis at cone 013, even lower. Um, and that the uh, lower bis temperature, um, that nobody there even knows what pinholing is, was his phrase. Um, Liz is asking, do I think 20% absorption should be the goal? Every clay body is going to have different absorption. That um, B mix from Stacy I showed you, what started at 17%, and that's just what it was. Um, um, so that it, it is whatever you want. I like it as high as an absorption level as you can get for a better application. Roy's asking, pinholes not equal to forming little bubbles that pop. Yes, no, they are little bubbles that pop, but they're bubbles that pop because of negative space. Uh, I can't pull up the videos anymore. I think it's just a dead stream now, uh, the video, but um, that uh, when you apply the glaze, all those little particles that I was showing at the beginning are um, uh, have negative space in between them. And that negative space, uh, the when the glaze melts, it melts around them. Um, and it will trap air. If those bubbles become so numerous or so large that they pop and heal, the gray glaze will crater and cause the pinhole that we know. Um, so let's see. So Stacy says, hey, let me know the lowest absorption you're able to get from that sample at maturity, please. Yeah, it was that cone 08. Although I didn't, uh, or a thousand, I didn't test your clay under a thousand though, Stacy. Um, um, I mean, you could try, you could try lower, um, but I, I, I didn't test it at that. I still have a chunk somewhere. If I have a firing, I'll throw it in there. Um, going to bis temperature. Let's see. Uh, Allison said, can I share some of your resources with my kids? Um, I generally don't distribute my PowerPoint slides, but um, if you contact my wife, Rose, R-O-S-E at ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. We are doing free programs for educators forced to go online. Um, and um, uh, uh, we probably can set you up with some free online workshops for your school. Uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's why I like a lower temperature bisque. You actually get better absorption and um, uh, uh, better uh application of the glaze so yeah absolutely um oh yeah roy's asking will wetting agent reduce tendency to trap air on application i have had several people um talk to me about this and that um it is common uh i had some students in europe that were saying that they um uh, had taken a commercial glaze workshop and the recommendation was to spray water on the surface of their bisque um, for um, uh, uh, glaze application. Um, there is, uh, the reason why they're doing that is because in a commercial glaze for a brushing glaze, what they're trying to do is that they don't want the glaze to absorb very quickly. You see, if you've ever tried to brush a studio glaze, you'll find that it, it just dries very, very quickly, okay? And if you're working with a brushing glaze, what that means is that you're going to get very inconsistent coats. With a commercial glaze, what they're trying to do is to not have the glaze dry quickly. So they add in uh, agents, that uh, chemical agents that will make the absorption um, uh, 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 retard. And so it'll go slower. If you wet your bisque, it's also going to slow down how long it takes for the water to be absorbed by the bisque. So you have more time to push that commercial glaze around. I don't necessarily think it's a good practice. I also don't use brushing glazes all that much. So 
um, you know, it is one versus the other, but it will slow it down. I use dipping glazes and spraying glazes, and I want my, I want my application to go fast. So for me, it is just what it is. Um, but that's what they're trying to do with wetting things down. Um, Aaron is asking, is there an equation for glaze viscosity? Um, like there's equation for specific gravity, the equate, there's not an equation. It's literally just drain time. So if you have a glaze that you say you use it and it's always, and you've got a Zon cup or there's some other types of cups, like a Ford cup. If you, um, have a, a 30 second drain on that cup, you want to always keep it at a 30 second drain. Okay. It's not a magic number, but you just have this numerical, um, representation of how long that drain should take because say the glaze has been thinned out. Say you've added too much water. Well, it'll drain a lot faster. And if you have too little water, it'll drain a lot slower. So you can add water or removing water is hard, but you can, you know, you can try, uh, to do that. Um, let's see. Melanie Shaw is asking, what about the length time of the bisque? Is that incorrect? Or, oh, yeah, okay, so Michelle just jumped in. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Stacy tell, tell me to shut up. Uh, I'll just say, uh, yeah, that's all nonsense that you don't need the uh, the other. Uh, the the, the bis, or people say you hold it until it smells clean. That's all nonsense. It's all clean long before uh, Kono 04 or even Kono 08. Uh, and then a Ford cup is just a different design than a Zon cup. The most important thing is the diameter of the hole. Okay, I will wrap it up there. Uh, uh, I am talking too much, but thank you everybody for stopping by. I guess this will go up on video here soon. Uh, if not, I'll post it on my YouTube channel because like I said, I made a recording of it too. Um, but um, yeah, once again, thank you everybody. Uh, I'll see you around Clay buddies. All right, talk to y'all later. Bye. Yeah, I see it. Uh, how do I end the live video? Oh, I clicked the button that says uh, end live video. There we go. If you end this live video, you know how to choose if you want to see.